Well, good morning, friends. Good to be with you this morning. I have a few less hairs than I did last week. <laughs> On purpose. <laughs> Um, if you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to the book of Hebrews? We're going to try and spend some time in this, in this letter for the next few weeks. I'm going to be reading Hebrews chapter 1, uh, verses 4 to 14 for us today. I think it's up on the screen for us as well. Starting at verse 4. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have become your father. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. In the speaking of the angels, he says, He makes his angels spirits and his servants flames of fire. But about the sun, he says, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. He also says, excuse me, in the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe, like a garment they will be changed. But you remain the same, and your years will never end. To which of the angels did God ever say, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? May God bless the reading of his word. Pastor Ross Cochran uh, tells this story. Julie and the kids were on their way home from the park when it happened. Ben was only about five years old and happily walking and running ahead of, head on the edge of the road. There was no footpath beside the road, but he was still on the grassy area. Then he must have seen our house on the other side of the road and headed towards it, edging onto the road just as a car roared up from behind him. Julie screamed for him to stop, but there was not enough time. To this day, Julie does not understand how it happened. He should have been run over. It looked to her as if Ben was picked up and thrown out of harm's way onto the grass. She believes a a guardian angel protected him. Today we're continuing our look at at, uh, the book of Hebrews. We're starting, uh, we started last week and uh, we're continuing here through chapter 1. Last week, we we learned that God continues to speak to humanity, uh, and even more so to his people, and and obviously even speaking to us through Christ. The main point the author of Hebrews is trying to communicate is that Jesus Christ, God's Son, is supreme over all things, including angels. Now, if you look at the order of beings, you would have humanity then angels, and then God at the top. Hebrews 2 verse 9 tells us that when Jesus became a man, he was made for a little while lower than the angels. Now angels are an immortal creation of God. Some chose to follow Satan's rebellion, but those remaining in heaven are also free from sin. Angels are talked about throughout the Bible. Uh, There are 108 direct references to angels in the Old Testament, and surprisingly, 182 in the New Testament. 
uh, one of the main purposes of the creation of angels was to stand in the presence of God and bring worship. Isaiah chapter 6 gives us this small glimpse. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne. And then the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. I want to talk just for a few moments about angels and uh, what their role, uh, what we see from Scripture their role is. Because they're found throughout Scripture, we, we, we do kind of get a pretty decent picture of what they're like. Uh, we don't know when they were created, but it does seem that they were created before the rest of creation. The Lord tells Job as he was laying the earth's foundations on what were its footing set or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. Job 38, verses 6 and 7. Uh, it, as, as they are, they, they are still uh, recognized as individuals with their own intelligence and personality. And, and they celebrate, we even see, we see that they celebrate with God when someone accepts Christ. Uh, you see that in Luke 15, verse 7. Now granted, knowing that they're individuals, we only know of two that are named specifically in Scripture, and that's Gabriel and Michael. We also see that angels don't have bodies like we do. Uh, verse 14 of our passage says they're ministering spirits. But with that, we read of times when they appear in human form. Uh, we would likely view them, I think, as superhuman. Uh, in Genesis 19.11, we see how they acted as protectors of God's people. Also, uh, in Daniel, uh, Daniel tells how an angel intervened in protecting him from the lions in the lion's den in Daniel 6. Both Joseph and Mary were visited by angels to, to share God's plan with them. And, and we even see in uh, Matthew... Uh, angels attending Jesus following his 40 days of fasting and being tempted by Satan, uh, Matthew 4.11. And then if you look uh, later on in, in the book of Hebrews, uh, chapter 13, verse 2 says, We're warned to be careful how we treat strangers, since we might be entertaining angels without knowing it. Pastor Paul Wallace shares this little story. He says, when I preached in Circleville about angels, the pastor's wife told me her story. She went down into town with the kids to do laundry, and a terrible winter storm hit while she was there. She was really afraid, so she prayed for God's protection for the trip back up the hill to her home. She said she felt someone physically sit down in the car seat beside her, although she saw no one. Then a vehicle went ahead of her and she was able to follow the taillights. When she pulled into her driveway and stopped, she felt someone physically leave the seat beside her, but again, no one was visible. Angels uh, are amazing creatures and, and we even see, uh, we see in scripture that they're part of a great host the heavenly host, uh, and that they're divided into ranks that, uh, with supervisory responsibilities over thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, authorities, and such. 
Uh, and it seems like, as far as what we can gather from Scripture, they're divided into three classes. Cherubim, seraphim, and what Ezekiel and Revelation call living creatures. Uh, you can see that in Ezekiel 1, 5 to 14, and Revelation 4, 6 to 8. Um, Augustine said, there is a certain greatness in the angels and such power that if the angels exert it to the full, it cannot be withstood. Angels are imposing figures. They are superior to humans because of the fall of humanity through Adam. They are stronger, they are faster, but as 2 Peter 2.11 tells us, they are inferior to God and they follow his commands and speak only what God directs them to. So as amazing as angels are, um, they do not compare to Christ. Christ is greater than the angels. The author lays out a pretty simple argument. Uh, we see Christ's greatness and authority through his names. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have become your father. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. Now names carried weight in those days. And they revealed much of the hopes the parents carried for their child. When you look throughout Scripture, you see how God chose specific names that related to the character or aspect of a person's life. So for God to title Christ Son was to set him above everyone else. And the author paraphrases Deuteronomy uh, chapter two, uh, 32, verse 43, to show that these powerful beings worshipped Christ as the Son. And Psalm 8, verse 5, refers to Christ and says that he was made a little lower than the angels, but he was crowned with glory and honor. The angels were to worship him. And if the angels are to worship Christ, it must mean that he is greater, uh, greater in status than they are. And Christ is greater uh, because of what we see in verse 7 as well. The nature of angels is different to the nature of Christ. Verse 7 says that God makes his angels winds and like a flame of fire. And that Greek word uh, for make is uh, poieo. And it basically means to make or create. Um, again, it points to angels being part of God's creation. But we see throughout the New Testament, Christ is no mere creation. Paul wrote to the Colossians, For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So Paul clearly understood that Jesus was superior to all of the seen and unseen in the created order. Angels are not only under his authority, but as the verse says, the angels were also made for him. Christ is also greater um, because as verses 10 to 12 lay out, Christ has a superior existence. The writer of Hebrews is clearly stating that Christ existed eternally. If Christ was in the beginning to create, of course he must have existed before the beginning. Those angels were created to worship and serve him. With the example given in the passage, just as you would roll up and throw away an old worn-out garment when you're done with it. With his authority, Jesus one day will discard the heavens and the earth. In both the Old and the New Testament, 
We're told God does not change. Malachi 3, 6 says, I, the Lord, do not change. So you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. And our author says something very similar. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Hebrews 13, 8. The writer is making sure that we know that Christ and the Father are the same. And as the Bible points out, everything finite may pass away, but Christ will stand forever. And as uh, we continue, verses 13 and 14 point out, Christ is greater because he has a superior destiny. No angel has ever been promised a place at God's right hand. That's reserved for Christ alone. The destiny of Jesus Christ is that ultimately everything in the universe will be subject to him. Paul told the Philippians that God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that, on, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So even in heaven, everything will bow to Christ. It's from Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 to 11. Abraham Kuyper put it this way. When Jesus looks at his universe from his exalted throne at the right hand of the Father... And he sees the great galaxies whirling in space, the planets and the people upon this planet, and all the minute details of life here, including the details of our individual lives. There is nothing that he sees anywhere of which he cannot say, mine. Marie Monson was born in 1878 in San. Sand Viken, Norway, uh, and she died in 1962. She was a Norwegian missionary active in North and Central China between 1901 and 1932. And one night, bandits surrounded the mission compound in the city where she was staying. There were hundreds of women and children in the compound. And Miss Monson had gone down with malaria the night before, and she was being plagued by such questions as, what will you do when the looters come here? When the firing begins on the compound, what about those promises that you've been trusting in? Well, she replied, Lord, I've been teaching these young people all these years that your promises are true. And if they fail now, my mouth will be closed forever. I must then go home. She was up all through the night ministering to the frightened refugees and encouraging them to pray and trust in God to deliver them. Although horrible things happened outside the compound, the bandits left the mission compound alone. In the morning, three different families from the neighborhood asked, who are those four people sitting uh, three, uh, four people, three sitting and one standing who watched from the top of your house all night long. And when she told them that no one had been on top of the house, they didn't believe her. We saw them with our own eyes. Well, she then told them that God still sends his angels to guard his children in their hour of danger. Now, angels aren't little cherubs that flutter around or genies that are sent to grant wishes. They also don't ha have to do complicated rescue missions in order to receive their wings. No, they're very powerful beings that are quite a bit otherworldly, and though they may simply be messengers um, and periodically assist believers, they also enforce, enforce the wrath of God the judgment of Jesus upon humanity. And even though they may be superhuman, we are not to pray to them or to seek them out. As they have pointed out, Jesus Christ is Lord of all, and He is our mediator, not them. Our worship 
is to be kept for Christ alone. Now, angels are important to God, but Christ is superior in all ways to everyone and everything on earth and in heaven. Scripture clearly tells us that. That is something that we need to remember. It's also something that we can continue to celebrate. That is something that we can also pass on to others. Now, I don't know if there's such a thing as a guardian angel. I, I, I can't answer that. And honestly, I'm not really worried about that. But I do know that if we trust Christ with our lives, if we place our lives in His hands, we are in the hands of the Almighty Creator. And that, I believe, should give us great peace. That is something to be more grateful for than whether or not an angel may come along and, and rescue us. So remember where your trust really needs to be today. In the hands of our Creator. In the hands of Christ. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you uh, for your word this morning. And Lord, it's not news to us, but uh, grateful for the reminder that Christ is superior to all things, both in heaven and on earth. And Lord, we know there are some, even in our world today, that put so much faith in angels. And yet they've forgotten the creator of those angels. And so thank you for Christ. Thank you for this word today. And Lord, help us to be able to pass that word on to others. That, that you, Lord, are superior to all. And that we can trust you and place our trust and place our lives in you. So grateful, God, for how you work in and through us. And I pray, Lord, that we would help others find the creator and not place their trust in the created thing. Continue to be with us in these moments, Lord. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.